our next speaker is uh, Rich Friesner, and I'm I, I deliberately am keeping my uh, introductions really, really short because I want to cede all of the time to the speakers. Um, and as you just heard, our speakers need no real introductions. So um, uh, you can see everything um, that I was going to say about Rich Friesner here. He's at Columbia. He uses computational models and his lab has really been a leader in this area. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, cede the floor to you, Rich, and go ahead and take it away. Okay. Well, thanks, Laura. And um, <clears throat> I too was uh, inspired by Bob Langer. And in my case, I saw <clears throat> here was a guy who had this incredible success in academia, but you know started many companies which have had a huge impact. So I've only started one, but uh, I th thank Bob for his for an inspiration in that regard. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about <clears throat> is really a story that's evolved over a, a very long time period. I, I would say more than forty years. And so the question is, can computation actually impact structure-based drug discovery projects in a, in a major way? So people in pharma, pharmaceutical companies have used structure-based, have used computation for many, many years. But the question is, can you actually drive a project? Can you, can you make an impact bigger than, than somebody saying, yeah, you know, I'm glad I ran that calculation. It was interesting, but I would have made the molecule anyway, which is often the comment you would get if you ask people uh, you know, how they were using the software. So the thesis uh, of what I'm about to talk about is that a combination of the increased computational power from Moore's law, and that's a gigantic number. I mean, that's billions of times more powerful than 1977, um, but also of equal impact, better algorithms, better real software platforms. You know, we finally gotten to the point where you can do ultra fast screening approaches on the computer, you can actually get hits a lot of the time, um, and you can do truly predictive high precision simulations, not all the time, but enough of the time to actually start uh, having a big impact on projects. And this is, as I said, more than a 40 year effort if you take as a starting point, for example, the 1977 simulation of proteins by uh, Martin Karplus's group, uh, Andy McCammon, um, so I'm going to spend most of the time talking about small molecule uh, design, and, and there's really three things in a drug discovery project in the, in the preclinical -cl pre phase that you do, um, where computation can make an impact, virtual screening, you try to find hits, uh, hit to lead, you try to optimize potency, and then in lead optimization, you actually have to do a multi-parameter optimization. So I'll talk about all of those things. Um, in the past four or five years, we've been trying to apply the same methods to biologics, to antibody optimization in particular, and we've made some progress on that. It's, it's behind the small molecule stuff, but I'll show you where, how far we've gotten. And then I'm going to talk about, you know, in the next five years, where do we think this can go? And uh, one place is, you know, if you can start refining structures so that you get them to the point where you can use these, these uh, high precision physics-based methods, um, then you could address a lot more targets. So if you're gonna apply computation to a project and actually try to advance the project in a serious way, you need a hierarchy of computational tools. So if you're gonna screen billions of compounds like an enamine library, you gotta have something fast. And so <clears throat> docking methods are a way of doing that, um, particularly rigid receptor docking, which can be, you know, take something like seconds per molecule. Um, and so that's one thing I'll mention. Um, that doesn't always work though. Many times when you, if you have a small molecule fitting into a protein target, the protein is going to reorganize. And so when protein motion is important, then you need to do something called induced fit docking. This is a much harder problem because you're moving many, many more degrees of freedom, but we've made some progress on it, particularly in the last uh, five years. And I'll show you sort of the latest uh, results we have for that. Um, 
you need to understand the water structure of the active site. And so about 10 years ago, Bruce Byrne and I introduced a method called water map, which actually maps out the free energies of localized water sites in, the, in, in a, a receptor. And that's used pretty extensively now throughout the pharmaceutical industry and plays an important role in, in docking and, and both induced fit docking and rigid receptor docking in the way we approach it. And then the final task is, is really trying to get the right answer, trying to get good numbers for predicting binding free energies. And so we and many other people use a method called free energy perturbation theory. Um, <clears throat> And so the, the difference between what we can do now and, and maybe 20, 30 years ago when Bill Jorgensen and, and Andy McCammon and other people first started to run these kinds of calculations is we can, we can reliably get something on the order of one kilocalorie per mole accuracy. And so I hope to convince you we can really do that, not in every case again, but in, in a pretty substantial fraction of cases. And that furthermore, we, we can, really look at a very large number of molecules by coupling this to artificial intelligence methods. And so the use of machine learning, artificial intelligence, I'm sure everybody knows that this is now an explosively growing field. And in fact, uh, you know, is likely going to increase over the years. But the coupling of this with physics-based simulation has some real potential because you can train these AI models with physics-based numbers. I mean, the challenge in using AI and drug discovery is how much data do you have? Well, if you've got a lot of data from physics-based simulations, that is a lot cheaper than trying to obtain it experimentally. So let me say a little bit first about rigid receptor docking methods. So the first doc docking program was produced by Tak Kuntz in roughly 1980. Um, and since you're only optimizing the ligand, the, the calculations are very fast, you know, something like seconds, maybe to minutes per compound. And the key thing there is that over the past five or six years, we've managed to improve the hit rates, even for very hard targets where you used to, you know, run these things and get zero hits, which was pretty uh, disappointing to say the least. And that's really come about through two uh, improvements. So one is, is really, Brian Choike has really taken the lead on this and gotten some fantastic results. And what he's shown is you start screening bigger and bigger and bigger libraries. It actually improves the hit rates and, and you get more potent compounds, at least in favorable cases. He hasn't looked at every single kind of target, but he's got enough data. I think that this is a real effect. And it's because when you have a really huge library, some of the molecules actually fit better into the active site, thereby overcoming the problem with rigid receptor docking, which is you're not moving the receptor. You need something that fits kind of like a lock and key, but a lot of ligands don't. So that's one advance. And the second one is just better scoring functions. And this is a super hard problem trying to take very complex physics with a lot of water molecules moving around and translate it into these empirical functions you can evaluate quickly. And I'll show you a few examples of uh, some of the advances that we've made using our what we call W score, which actually takes water molecules and puts them on the grid when you do docking. So here, in fact, is a picture of the, the kind of picture you get out of water map. Um, so you see all those spheres. Those are all water molecules. This is factor 10A. So uh, Xarelto is a billion dollar drug. It's a, it's a um, binds to this receptor. And the key thing is that for many, many years, there was a, an attempt to drug this target using charged molecules. You see this pocket down here, you've got this sort of recessed aspartic acid. So people would bind positive nitrogens here. And those compounds didn't work very well because they weren't very bioavailable. You had trouble, there was trouble getting them into the cell. So the key point that was recognized somewhat accidentally in the beginning, but, but then when you do the calculations, it becomes apparent. You see this water molecule right down here so you stick, you have to stick a methyl group or typically a chloro group here to actually displace this thing. But this thing just has a very, very large uh, delta G of, you know, that you recover when you displace this thing into solution because it's in such a bad location. It's surrounded by hydrophobic groups. And so water map just maps out the displacement free energies of all these waters. And then as a medicinal chemist looking at this, you can say, well, I should target this region, that region, and so on, in order to improve the molecule optimally. 
And so here's a couple of things that WaterMap, you know, recognizes and is able to, when it looks at ligands, automatically say, you know, this is not a good thing to be doing. So here's, this is HSP90. This has been a drug target for many years. And here's a, an active compound. And you can see that it cleverly avoids uh, displacing this water over here. This water is special because it's a triply bound water. It makes three hydrogen bonds. And it turns out that you, it's very hard to replace something making three hydrogen bonds with a chemical group, right, of the ligand. What, what would do it? A hydroxyl can replace something making two hydrogen bonds, but three is, an, is very hard. So many ligands will come in and displace this water, and those are dead compounds, but it's hard to recognize it unless you have an explicit water in here and you say, okay, I see that this thing has three hydrogen bonds. I'm going to penalize a ligand that displaces it. So that's the kind of improvements that we've made in advancing the scoring functions. And here's just some data. So when we run the new method W score, we dock 50,000 property match decoys. They're very difficult decoys. They look a lot like actives. We recover 38 out of 50 in the top 50 scoring compounds, 38 out of 50 are known actives. When you dock sort of a standard scoring function, this is, this is our standard scoring function that people still use very extensively in the pharmaceutical industry, you actually recover zero out of the top 50. So you keep making those kind of advances and hopefully, as I said, you can start to attack very hard targets. Okay, so induced fit docking, there are typically many low energy receptor conformations that can accommodate a small molecule ligand. So uh, many of us learned about the lock and key picture of uh, enzymes and small molecule binding to proteins. Proteins, the lock, the ligand is the key. You put the key in the lock, you're all set, except that the lock is not rigid, right? It moves around all sorts of side chain motions, backbone motions. So what the data I'll show you is attempting to address side chain motions, but we can do the same thing with backbone motions. It's a little technically more demanding. Um, and so over a period of about 15 years, we've gradually assembled an algorithm that combines conformational search, which is where you have to start with these kind of problems with molecular dynamics once you've got some decent guesses for the complex. And you'll see that the accuracy, the reliability now is pretty high. And that's the challenge is making it reliable. I mean, it's not hard to take an individual case and show that, you know, say, okay, anecdotally, this case works, but to take hundreds of cases, thousands, and get them to work, that's what you need to do to believe it's going to work in a project where you have to predict something, and then people are going to spend millions of dollars making compounds based on the structure. So this algorithm is more than 100 times faster than just brute force molecular dynamics, which you can do to, predict, to make induced fit predictions. People at Desiras have done this, but they have to run hundreds of microseconds of MD and that's extremely expensive. And so here's just an illustration of why you often have to run induced fit docking. Here's a ligand, this is from CDK2, which has been a drug target for many years. And you're just taking a, a ligand from one conformation, docking it into a different conformation. And you see in this particular case, when you superimpose the correct binding pose with the, the new receptor, the new conformation, you have these clashes with these lysines. And so the obvious thing is you look at this and you say, gee, why don't you just move those out of the way? And of course that's correct. But if you know the answer before you start, you could figure that out. But to do this in an automated fashion is hard. And often you will find surprising alternative bad structures where just looking at them, it wouldn't be obvious. Why should this one lose and the other one win? But an algorithm, has been optimized over many years, takes into account many features of the complex and is able to pick out the right answer quite reliably. And so here's some statistics. This is a, we have bigger data sets now. This is from a couple of years ago, but this is about 260 cases. And you see, if you compare the success rate of induced fit docking with, for example, uh, just rigid receptor docking, you see that over here, you get that one of the first two structures is succeeds 95% of the time in being more or less the right answer as opposed to 41% in the case of rigid receptor. This is an older version without the molecular dynamics. You see the kind of improvements that we've made. <coughs> 
And so we've been using this in projects. And so this has actually succeeded in a, in a significant number of cases where we didn't know the answer before we started. We made a prediction about uh, what the binding mode should be. And then the crystal structure was obtained and agreed pretty well. So this is becoming emerging as a, a technology that actually can be used in, in a systematic way. Okay, let me move on now to talk about lead optimization and free energy perturbation theory. So FEP is a trick. It was a tr it's a trick that on paper was worked out 50 years ago by Bob Zwanzig, who was a brilliant statistical mechanician. And it's a way of directly calculating free energy differences between two ligands which are similar, okay? So in a trivial example, or not so trivial all the time, but you change a hydrogen to a chlorine on a ring, for example, and then FEP in principle will directly calculate that free energy difference and tell you, does that improve the binding? Does it make it worse? Or does it stay the same? And you can change right now with the, with the, the platform that we have, maybe 10 to 12 atoms and expect to get pretty good answers, assuming everything else works well. And so in the beginning, it was hard to get good answers. You couldn't run the codes, you couldn't run things long enough back 40, 50 years ago. The force fields weren't accurate enough, but all these things have improved more or less exponentially. Um, and so I'm gonna describe the current package that we use. And this is a collaboration between uh, people at Columbia, Bruce Byrne uh, and my, my group in particular. And Bill Jorgensen, who was really an FEP pioneer and, and you know, went through many lonely years where people didn't believe it would ever work and published a lot of papers and gave everyone hope um, and then worked with us. You know, we started with his OPLS force field and then he worked with us and with people at Schrodinger to produce a really reliable sort of industrial strength platform that's now being widely used in the pharmaceutical industry. So here's a, an illustration of, you know, the kinds of tests you have to make to see whether you're, are you getting the right answer for the right reason? So these are data sets from the literature. The first thing we did was retrospective analysis and you can see there's eight different targets. These are all fairly well-known drug targets. Some are currently active, some aren't, but they're all pretty well-known. Ligand data sets are typical of what you'd find in a medicinal chemistry paper. So somewhere between 10 and 40 ligands. And this is just showing the effect of improving the force field over a period of about uh, 10 years. And, you know, it doesn't look that spectacular, right? So these numbers, this number doesn't look that different from this one, but it turns out it makes a huge difference. When you have an RMS error over here of about one and a half kilocalories, that's very hard to rank order things when you need to get one, you know, high precision in rank ordering, you're talking about trying to improve things by a couple of kilocalories, right? Um, and so as the methods have advanced, we have better and better RMS errors from more and more of the targets. And if you look at the, look at the correlation coefficients, you, all, you see that they're around, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, even 0 0.7, and that's good enough to do rank ordering. So there's some, there appears to be some kind of limit to what precision we can get. And it's around a kilocalorie, maybe 0.9, maybe 0.8. Some of this is probably experimental since the experimental error in binding assays is probably half a kilocalorie at best. But here you can see sort of the latest version. This is an advance over the previous data I showed you. And the key point is here's a whole bunch of systems down here where all of a sudden the RMS error in our previous force field, which looked like it was so great, you know, two kilocalories, these are actually Schrodinger internal projects. And so, you know, these are unacceptable, these numbers here, and, and this, these numbers aren't so good. And so as we improve the method, I don't have time to discuss the details. The goal is to make this to the point where more and more and more systems fall into this domain of about a kilocalorie where you can actually advance a project pretty effectively because the rank ordering is good enough. So this is now, I'm gonna say a little bit, some of this data that I'm gonna talk about has been generated by Schrodinger because you have to, in order to really test these things, you need data generated at an industrial scale. In order to improve things, you need a feedback cycle where you're looking at thousands, tens of thousands of data points and re-optimizing things and retesting it and trying new predictions and so on. And so this is over this particular slide, which is a little old. I mean, there's much more data now than there is on this slide, 
but you know, you have roughly 100 projects, thousands of molecules, many, many different companies, many of them, by the way, running the program themselves. And so this RMS error just stays more or less the way it is. And the correlation coefficient is about 0.6 over all these data points. So this appears to be real. It's not an artifact of just looking at a few data sets and saying, hey, look how great these numbers are. This appears to be an actual industrial strength technology now, which a lot of people are using. Now here, I'm gonna show you how do you couple this with artificial intelligence to look at a much larger chemical space. So this is kind of the dream of medicinal chemists going back 50 or 100 years. Instead of looking at you know, hundreds of molecules, can you look at millions, billions, trillions, huge numbers. So the point is you can take a very large set of analogs and it's easy to come up with a billion analogs, right? If you have three substitution points and a thousand, a thousand candidates per point, that's 10 to the ninth right there in terms of combinatorially uh, mixing everything together. And so you pick some random molecules from there, you train that you run FEP, you get some numbers, and now you train a machine learning model based on those thousand results. And then you go back and recalculate, you re and pick a new thousand molecules with the machine learning and then redo FEP and you can recycle this. And meanwhile, you make a few compounds each time at the top of the list. And eventually you find things that actually advance the program. So here's a, a, an example um, where we had an interaction with, with a, a group in pharma which didn't believe that we could do what we said. So they said, we, we, want, we want to give you a challenge. And so they wanted us to do a head-to-head -head competition with their medicinal chemists using three different methods. One of them is basically visual inspection, looking at the structure. That's the one that's called MedChem. And these were a couple of approximate methods where they looked at the structure and did some simpler calculations. And the challenge was, this is, this is Cathepsin L, it's a, it's a well-known target. They said, we're gonna give you 2,500 candidates. You pick 10, we'll make the 10, and let's see how everybody does in improving the potency. So the potency of the original molecule was about 10 micromolar, and the goal was to improve it you know, down to a low nanomolar. And so what you can see here is that this compound here was found by three of the methods. This compound differs from the initial compound by one atom. So yes, you can find that by visual inspection. But if you ask the question, how did visual inspection do it finding anything else? The answer is very poorly. FEP on the other hand found, you know, roughly eight out of the 10 compounds are in the ballpark. And these methods didn't do any better. So this is the kind of improvement you can see when you get FEP calculations working. Now I'm gonna talk about a couple of very specialized applications which are very important in drug discovery projects. So one of them is selectivity. So um, you, this, this project, TIC2, is based on a family of <coughs> kinases, which are very important in the immune system. So there's the JAK family, JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, TIC2. Pfizer has a pan-JAK inhibitor called Zeljaz. It's a billion dollar drug. It's the only oral autoimmune drug at this point that's on the market. Um, but the problem is it has side effects, anemia and, infect, and infection, and susceptibility to infection. So biologists have proposed that if you only inhibit TIC2, you're gonna do better and you can get rid of the side effects and have the same treatment of autoimmune diseases. But the problem is these family members are incredibly similar. Some of them differ in the first shell by only a few amino acids in the active site. So, you run FEP on all the targets, you dock the molecules in, you run it on all the targets and it costs a couple of dollars per calculation. And so we ran 4,000 idea molecules through all four targets. We picked things to test experimentally in which the selectivity was better than a hundred fold on three out of those four targets. And you look at these molecules and I can tell you that just visually inspecting them, you have, wouldn't have a clue that you'd get better selectivity out of one of them, okay, than you would out of the others, out of the others. So that's an example of where FEP can have a transformative effect on projects. And this is, we're seeing this in, in, in quite a few other projects. 
Here's another example, so mutational resistance. So this is a very simple question, right? This happens to be um, able kinase, and I'm sure everybody knows that you know, the Gleevec was very successful for a while and there started to be mutant variants that rendered it less effective, which you can actually see in this plot because here's the loss of potency in Gleevec when you make this mutation. Here's a bunch of PDB uh, other ligands. Here's the FEP prediction of the effect of mutation. And you can see the correlation with experiment is extremely good. And so again, you can use this technology to design compounds, which from the get-go have, you can build in mutational resistance. Okay, let me turn now to using FEP for biologics. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, so the system that we're looking at, we looked at initially is um, HIV uh, GP120 bound to a broadly neutralizing antibody. And so here's a picture of the system here. Here's the interface, the experimental data generated by Peter Kwong and coworkers at the NIH VRC, change all these residues into, uh, mutate them all into alanine. Here are the predictions. You see that again, you know, the RMS error is less than a kilocalorie. There's a very good correlation with experiment. Uh, one interesting point that uh, Carolyn and Laura might be interested in is that a bunch of these cases, there's a glycan on the surface. We had to model the glycan. If you do the calculations without it, you get garbage, but that works. So uh, that's encouraging in terms of using FEP for other things involving glycans, which is something I think we can do, although we haven't tried it yet. And you can, do, you can even do something where you change the charge of the amino acid. And that's hard technically for various reasons, but it works fine. So now um, that's kind of where we are now. So now the question is, where are we going? So the first thing is one of the questions that, that people have raised throughout this entire process is, you know, what is the benefit of doing computation? What do you really get out of it? Well, one thing you get is you don't have to make as many molecules. The programs are faster. So we see that already. We can, we can generate development candidates in 18 months and we have lots of programs. Schrodinger's running 25 programs at this point. But then people will say, well, okay, are your compounds any good? And of course, that's the critical question. So that's a question that takes longer to answer because you gotta watch things go through the clinic. And so there's already a couple of compounds in phase one, morphic therapeutics, relay therapeutics. We worked very closely with both companies on their phase one compounds. Schrodinger has three programs right now that are projected to enter the clinic next year. Um, so we're gonna see, can you actually design better molecules? Because you should be able to. I mean, if you're addressing this giant chemical space instead of a much more restricted one, the molecules that come out should be better. Can you effectively use FEP to, for ADME targets? So that's something that we're in the process right now of working on for HERG, for PXR, P450. There's issues with producing the structures, but we're making progress. I would say in the next five years, I'll, my prediction is we're going to have pretty good models for all of these things. Um, Sorry yeah. to interrupt, but we just have three minutes. So I just want to make sure that you this get to slide. everything you want. OK, yeah, thank you. The last slide. Um, so we're gonna start applying this to antibodies, um, cryo-EM, you know, there's gonna be more structures out there. Um, and then structure prediction is something that can enable more targets. And I'll just say one thing as a closing statement. So I've worked in this field now for 35, 40 years. And you know, it feels pretty good when you make some kind of advance, but then you see a talk like Carolyn's and you say, you know something, no matter how fast we go, we're just running to remain in place because these guys are working on just more complicated, more amazing structures. Are we ever going to be able to model, you know, one of these conjugates interacting with a glycan at the surface of a cell? And I don't know, but it's inspiring because it gives us, it shows us that we're not going to run out of things to do. So here's a list of collaborators from many places, including Schrodinger, but also people from Columbia and lots of other people who've been involved in this work and thank you for your attention. Thanks so much. Um, I'm gonna put my clapping hands up here. Um, so I, we, have, we have time if there is one quick uh, question from the group. 
I don't see anything in the chat right now, but Mark, were you raising your hand? You're on mute. No, I was clapping. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Rich. Um, I, I, I guess um, I, you answered right at the end my question about glycosylation. So that I think is actually really exciting for the, for the future because that has been such a problem in uh, computational studies that, that there's a lack of predictive quality. So I'm really impressed how you're handling and tackling all these complex systems? Well, we got a long way to go, but, um, you know, and like I said, it's always, you know, you always have this shock when you realize that you're, like I said, you're running very hard to stay in place. But I do think, you know, you look, I mean, five, 10 years ahead and, you know, could you take some of these instruments that you guys are building and try to refine them by predicting, you know, okay, I can make a mutation here and get better selectivity, get better tighter binding, Fat, you know, whatever it is you wanted to do, that will happen eventually. Question of how quickly it will happen, that's harder to predict. Well, um, I'm going to uh, follow up with you some other time because I'm really interested in um, how well we can actually calculate things like uh, glycan protein interactions because I think a lot of those features are not as well worked out as sort of the small molecule sense. So, um, so. Uh, that's for a different day, though. Let's go ahead and move um, on. But thank you again, Rich.